Hello, and welcome to Fostering Connections with the Natural World, a Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Amanda Beck, a research associate with the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Through this series, we will hear from practitioners and researchers <laughs> who are creating healthier communities, healthier landscapes, and healthier people through increased connections with nature. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched with partner cities spanning the globe from San Francisco, California, Wellington, New Zealand, and Singapore. This series is one way the Biophilic Cities Project aims to help share knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world who are championing biophilic design. Today, we will hear from Sue Thomas, author of Technobiophilia. She is a visiting fellow in the Media School at Bournemouth University and was professor of new media in the Institute of Creative Technologies at De Montfort University. Thomas earned her PhD and bachelor degree from Nottingham Trent University. In addition to her writings and teachings on the connection between wired culture and the natural world, she is a member of CyberParks the EU-funded network of 26 countries examining the future of urban parks. Her column, Wired Wellbeing, is hosted by theconversation.com, a collaborative website of editors and academics that provides informed news analysis and commentary. Today, Thomas will speak for 30 minutes to be followed by questions from the audience. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much to Tim Beatley and his team for inviting me to speak, and thanks to all of you for logging in. I'm talking to you from Bournemouth in the UK, a seaside town on the south coast, where today it's pretty cold, but the sun is bright. And I'm going to use this opportunity to ask you to think about the place of the digital in biophilic cities. Despite the fact that technology enables, oh, hang on, I've started off without going through my slides. Despite the fact that technology enables so many aspects of modern life, it's often seen as a problematic intruder, especially with regard to our relationship with nature. And at this point, you should be seeing a very funny cartoon from The New Yorker, which unfortunately didn't make its way um, across the Atlantic into this presentation. So you have to imagine there's a joke on this page. Some people believe that smartphones, tablets, and computers make us forget that there's a physical world out there, that they deplete our energies and attention, maybe even make us sick. For such individuals, the answer is to build fences between what they see as their, quote, real lives and the time they have to spend online because of their jobs or their lifestyle. They turn off their internet at weekends, go on digital detox holidays where they can leave their phones at the door, and frown on virtual communities like Facebook. But others, and I am one of them, see the digital as a chance to enhance our relationship with the world, to provide more opportunities to benefit from nature, not less, and to share our biophilic pleasures with a wider audience. So I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which the digital can make a positive contribution to the biophilic city. I don't mean in terms of technical infrastructure, but by a genuinely biophilic attributes. Because one thing is for sure, you can't talk about cities without talking about technology. So when we bring nature into the mix, the digital must come along with it. So my talk's going to cover a few words about my background and my research. Then I'll look at my notion of technobiophilia and ask what might a technobiophilic city look like. Um, and end with some words about technobiophilic design and then wrap up with a conclusion. So first, my background. My background is a little unconventional. I'm currently a freelance author and a visiting fellow at Bournemouth University. I left full-time academia in 2013, by which time I held a professorial chair in new media at De Montfort University in Leicester, UK. I was based in the Institute of Creative Technologies, a transdisciplinary group focused on researching new ways to make and use technology. 
My area of expertise was social media, digital culture, and online community. I managed practice-based research projects, often with local groups, which explored the application of social media and future thinking in community or business settings. My work is very transdisciplinary and hard to define, and I always seem to find myself working between the lines and across silos, straddling several different disciplines at a time. I came to academia in my late 30s. I studied as a mature student for a degree in humanities, which in my case meant English, history and computing. And soon after that, I became a writer. My first book, called Correspondence, was shortlisted for the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Best Science Fiction Novel in 1993. It featured two overlapping stories, one about technology, the other about nature. Even then, I was fascinated by this unlikely combination. But I didn't just write about technology. I worked in it, too. By the mid-1990s, I was earning a living from teaching creative writing by day and at the same time experimenting with the newly born World Wide Web whenever I got the chance. Luckily for me, it was a time when the English Arts Council was keen to support creative experiments, and they gave me a large funding award for three years to create an international online project for writers. So it was that I founded the Trace Online Writing Community, which spread across the world and ran for 10 years until 2004. When we started, very few people even had email. Long before Facebook in those years, we built many online meeting places and we learned how to work together in cyberspace. Since then, I've managed numerous online and social media research projects, and I've also taught online a good deal. For me, cyberspace is my natural habitat. This picture, for example, is of my avatar exploring a virtual forest in Second Life. In case you're not familiar with it, Second Life is a virtual world where people design and create all kinds of landscapes. This one, for example, is called Chakra and Forest. It's very imaginative and really quite beautiful. But you may be wondering, what has all this got to do with biophilic cities? Well, I've been invited here, I think, because there's been a lot of interest in my most recent book, Technobiophilia, Nature and Cyberspace. It's about the powerful synergy between nature and our connected lives online. It looks at how, ever since the internet was born, we have imported elements of the natural world into the digital, and usually with positive results. For example, virtual interactions, like the one we're having right now, can often conjure intense, often sensory experiences, which do pierce the membrane between the real and the virtual. Even now, if you stop for a moment and pause to reflect on how this experience feels to you personally, as I speak to you live from my study at home, where for me it's almost dinner time, you may be in a different physical place, in a different time zone, coming up to a different meal time, but we're also together here in cyberspace. How does that feel? Where is your body? Where is your mind? I've been working online for over 20 years and I still can't stop wondering about these things. So a bit about my research. For me, being with you in digital space is different from meeting you in physical space, but it's just as real. And I discussed this in 2004 in my book, Hello World, Travels in Virtuality. It was inspired by Thoreau's Walden, an account of living the simple life in a hut in the woods close to nature. Hello World was an attempt to take a Thoreauvian approach to the experience, not of being in nature, but of being in cyberspace. The jacket image captures it very well, I think, because it depends on which way you choose to look at the pictures. You can either um, look at the keyboard and imagine yourself logging on, or you can look through the keyboard and see another world on the other side of the keyboard. In this case, it was actually a view through an adobe window to trees outside. Um, so being in cyberspace, you often do get that feeling of being in two places at the same time. And writing that book made me realize how powerfully my imagination has always connected the natural world with the places I inhabit online. 
So after that book, I started to wonder whether other people felt the same, and I began researching another book. This time, I wanted to explore the language of cyberspace and to hunt for metaphors which might reveal the degree to which we understand the virtual as a, as a natural space. Lakoff and Johnson famously said that, quote, the essence of metaphor lies in understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another, unquote. This underpinned my hypothesis, and I was soon able to demonstrate that many of the words we use to describe online phenomena are derived from nature. Surfing the web, streams of data, viruses, bugs, swarms, clouds, and so on. But why? That was the question I set out to answer. And it would be quite a few years and many wrong turns before I found a concept that opened a window to what was really going on. Now, Usually, it's at this point in the presentation that I spend quite some time explaining E.O. Wilson's biophilia hypothesis and discussing the plethora of environmental psychology research which demonstrates the restorative qualities of nature. I usually explain Wilson's definition of biophilia as an innate human tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes. I talk about the Kaplan theory of attention restoration and research by Ulrich, Orions, Kellett, Mark Berman, and others. And that's all because I usually speak to audiences who have no background in those areas at all, and often have never even heard of biophilia unless it's an album by Björk. But on this occasion, with a biophilic city's audience, I'm confident that you're already up to speed with all of that, so I'll spare you that section. But I would, however, like to draw your attention to remind you of the Kaplan's notion of nearby nature. Instances of nearby nature are small suggestions of the natural world, as you know, which, although seemingly insignificant and often out of physical reach, can play a powerful role in human well-being. Even the sight of a few trees viewed through a window can provide a sense of satisfaction, and people with access to nearby natural settings have been found to be healthier than those without. Studies show they experience increased levels of satisfaction with their home, job, and life in general. Nearby nature doesn't even have to be beautiful or complex, and you don't even have to be physically close to it to gain the benefits. It seems just as potent when viewed through a closed window or seen pictorially via a photograph, a painting, a video, or even something as mundane as a wall calendar. So it seems reasonable to assume that it can also be experienced via the screen of a computer or a phone. So having begun my research by asking why have we named cyberspace and the images of the natural world, and having worked through a great deal of research which was very new to me, environmental psychology, I felt I'd found the answer. And I felt, felt that the answer was in that deeply ingrained sensibility that we know as biophilia. I came to understand that as we explored and colonized the new place we call cyberspace, we encountered new phenomena and experiences that have no name. So like many explorers of new worlds, we looked for whatever it reminded us of and called it by those metaphors. Here are just three examples, of course, many more in the book. First, the woman who coined the term surfing the web back in 1992 chose it because she saw exploring the internet as an exciting and risky activity, just like surfing, which incidentally she'd never done. And there are lots of other water metaphors in cyber culture too, oceans and streams of data, rivers, clouds, and so on. It's probably one of the most common metaphors. Second, we think of virtual terrain as if it were a real landscape. In the early days, it was often described as a lawless, borderless frontier, sometimes as a homestead, an eye village, sometimes as a walled garden, and it was uh, navigated by, you will remember, the information superhighway, which was so contentious that in the end, the decision whether or not it, the, the information superhighway was real had to be settled in courts of law when it started to involve um, money and boundaries. Uh, they decided in the end that it was not real. Um, third, our response to the scary and hostile parts of the internet has been to adopt the names of creatures we're afraid of, worms, viruses, bugs, swarms, and so on. This has been going on ever since the discovery of the first computer bug 
which actually was a real moth, by the way, trapped amongst some circuits. So that even as early as 94, there were enough examples to fill a book like this one on the subject. Not biophilic language, but certainly biophobic. And we're not just appropriating words from nature. We take images into cyberspace too. How many of you, for example, decorate your phone or computer with screensavers and wallpapers featuring beautiful pictures of forests, waterfalls, gardens? Do you share pictures of blue skies, golden beaches and stunning flowers with your friends? Do you even perhaps play online games like the Facebook game Farmville, where you can pretend to grow and harvest your own vegetables? After I published an article on this last year, researchers at Zynga, the company that makes Farmville, contacted me to say that their user research demonstrates time and time again that many players report enhanced well-being and stress relief after playing the game. But until they learned about technobiophilia, they had no amount, idea of the amount of environmental psychology research that has already been done, which provides the reason for that. I imagine that for the most part, there's currently very little interaction between computer game designers and environmental psychologists. Perhaps there should be more. Anyway, as I discovered, more and more examples of the ways in which we bring nature into our digital lives it seemed increasingly likely to me that this was a subconscious process, not deliberate. When I asked people if they used images of nature as desktop wallpapers or screensavers, large numbers of them said they did, but they'd never thought about why. I began to suspect that without any expressed rationale, they were using this nature too, as I say in the title of this talk, to soothe their connected minds and to balance their wired lives. But wait, there was an obstacle. A green sa screen saver of a forest is nothing at all like the sensory experience of actually being in a forest. My idea was elegant, but it was rather far-fetched until I realized something else. Quite a number of the experiments I had read about involved exposing subjects not to real nature, not to actually going outside, but to represent representations of nature. Nature seen through windows, in photographs, on video. In other words, the subjects often exhibited benefits from encountering a tree as it was seen through a window, a garden as it was viewed in a photograph, a sea view as it was watched on video, yes, on a screen. For example, Ulrich's famous experiment with patients recovering from gallbladder, remo gallbladder removal surgery were assigned to a room either with a window facing a brick wall or to a window overlooking a natural scene. Then there was the experiment which found that stressed blood donors sitting in a room with a video of a nature scene playing on TV experienced lower blood pressure and blood pulse rates, another screen. I think that may have been Ulrich's experiment too. And there were many more, again, detailed in my book. So I got to thinking. If restorative effects can be produced via windows, photographs, video, even paintings of nature, then why not screens? Why not the animated live wallpaper on my mobile phone, where the fish wiggle away when I press my finger against the surface as if I were really touching them, where I can even pretend to drop virtual food and they will pretend to virtually eat it? Some researchers are way ahead of this. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's a long description here in my notes of an experiment by um, Dolce Valchinov, which I'm going to cut short, but to see the full um, information, then you need to look in the book, I'm afraid. You may be familiar with Mark Berman's experiments into the effects of the unattention of walking around a park as opposed to um, an urban environment. In this case, they really did walk around a park. Well, psychologist Dolce Valchinov used Berman's um, project to conduct a very similar experiment in virtual reality. Without going into the details through lack of time, I can tell you that it was apparent in their results that it was virtual nature, as you can see here, quote, it is virtual nature that it is responsible for the observed restoration in the subjects and not virtual reality itself. 
the results showed that immersion in the computer-generated virtual reality nature space, nature space prompted an increase in positive affect, happiness, friendliness, affection, and playfulness, and a decrease in negative affect, fear, anger, and sadness. There were also significant decreases in stress. And although the environments had been carefully controlled to be as similar as possible except for their themes, only those subjects who were immersed in virtual nature showed improved responses across the board. Here's another example. Um, in, 19, in 2008 in Spain, researchers looked at a TV advertising campaign which was using virtual nature scenarios in the marketing of green projects, products. They found that simulated nature experiences could be remarkably powerful. Um, the, the company was attempting to green its image with a television campaign developed to evoke virtual nature experiences through the use of pleasant nature imagery such as flying eagles, mountain scenery, and waterfalls with strap lines of things like, quote, now every time you switch on your light, you can feel good because you're helping nature, unquote. The researchers reported that the consumers responded very positively to the new branding, all the way from people who considered themselves already to be environmentally con conscious to the non-concerned. All of them experienced warm glow benefits and a positive feeling of participating in the common good of the environment. At the end of the day, the researchers were very worried about this because they warned that, quote, people may eventually downgrade the value of local nature environments because of their experiences of, with virtual nature being so positive. I call this phenomenon technobiophilia. I have built upon Wilson's original definition to propose that technobiophilia is, quote, the innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes as they appear in technology. And I would say that the key elephant elements of technobiophilia are something like this. They can be found in practices and artifacts which either connect our lives in nature with our lives in the digital, or contribute to well-being via a tech-nature balance, or even support future biodiversity as technology and nature start to move closer together. So here are a couple of examples which fit that bill, I think. At Dorset County Hospital in Dorchester, England, a patient lies awake watching the sunrise. She's being treated in an isolation ward with limited window views, yet technology enables her to observe the changing hues just meters from her bed as the sun climbs into the sky. On the wall across from her bed, a live feed is being streamed from a webcam positioned on the roof of a castle a few miles away. She can see the sun rise over the gardens. And as a patient who is confined to an isolation room used for immunocompromised patients with leukemia and other blood cancers, um, she probably has had to stay alone in her room for long periods of time. So during those terrible nights when a seriously ill patient lies awake in pain or is afraid and can't sleep, they can at least look forward to seeing a real-time sunrise taking place right there in their room. Or there is the PIP, a handheld biosensor which connects to your phone or tablet and works by sensing electrical charges at the surface of the skin, which indicates your stress levels. This mobile app uses biofeedback to help you measure, understand, and manage your stress. The idea is that the, um, the top uh, picture is a frozen landscape. The la landscape at the bottom is a, a melted spring landscape. And you are the person who, with your own mind, can bring about that melting and movement into the spring via your phone or your tablet. Um, and the, the, the picture itself is made up of photographs of real places taken in Ireland. So it's very much a composite of a, a real landscape and can help people reduce stress by using biofeedback techniques. Um, third example is this, which is um, the Grand Chaparral, a picture from the game Grand Theft Auto. 
Designed in Scotland, this complex and hugely popular game is set in the fictional state of San Andreas, which looks a lot like California. GTA, as it's known, is notorious for its high levels of crime and violence, and less well known are the landscape beauty spots to be found there. Landscape photographer Phil Rose started a Flickr group which he describes as the home for photographs taken by photographers in Grand Theft Auto V, where there are many opportunities, he said, for landscape photography in all weathers and times of day. These images are a gift for anyone interested in technobiophilia in games. The landscapes have a pattern of graphic design which reminds you that they're grown from pixels rather than soil. But the vantage points from which they're taken absolutely feel like the photographer was physically there next to that tree or beneath that sky. So those were just a few examples of how the virtual can intertwine with nature. But now I'd like to ask what might a technobiophilic city look like? Tim Beakley has given us this, this definition. Cities of abundant nature in close proximity to large numbers of urbanites. Biophilic cities are biodiverse cities that value, protect, and actively restore this biodiversity. Biophilic cities are green and growing cities, organic and natureful. Well, what might be some of the elements of a technobiophilic city? Here, for example, is the Escal Numérique, otherwise known as Digital Break in Paris. It's a Wi-Fi refuge designed like a park. It's a revival um, of the underground fiber optic network, which is now supplying the capital, but is very re resonant of the early Wallace fountains, which since the end of the 19th century have offered Parisians free drinking water, which circulated beneath their feet. Now, Escal Numérique allows everybody to benefit from another public service, a high-speed Wi-Fi connection, by raising it from beneath the ground. Or there's an idea of bioluminescent trees, which is basically involves genetically engineering trees to turn them into street lights as well. And um, I also wanted to mention uh, cyber parks, which um, is, as um, Amanda mentioned, is the EU cyber parks network of which I'm a member. We have members in 26 EU countries and we're funded for four years. Our aim is to foster knowledge about the relationship between ICT and public spaces and to develop strategies. So we've developed um, a, a working definition, which you see at the bottom of the screen, that a cyber park is a new type of urban landscape where nature and cyber technologies blend together to generate hybrid experiences and enhance quality of life. And one element which will be increasingly important as our research progresses is the notion of technobiophilic design. According to Stephen Kellett, who I think first coined the term, biophilic design applies biophilic concepts to architecture and design in such a way that it, quote, connects buildings to the natural world, buildings where people feel and perform better. Technobiophilic design is very much in its infancy, um, but I developed this um, similar quotation developed from Kellett in which we would say that technobiophilic design connects our digital lives to the natural world so that we can feel and perform better. Technobiophilic design is very much in its infancy, but last year I had the opportunity to try out the idea when I was invited to set a technobiophilic design challenge to a hacker conference in Rio de Janeiro. Um, I had to draw up two sets of design challenges for developers, one for apps and wearables, and one for hardware and software. Unfortunately, there's no time to give you the details, but you can find it um, on my website, um, the full um, spec that I drew up. But this one second prize, this was the Technobiophilic Design. Um, designers were given a range of different design challenges, so this was just one of them. And what came second was Symbio. It's a wearable device, a mobile app, a glass jar with a plant, an irrigator, a light bulb, and sensors. The idea is that the, the kit acts as a technological medium which activates the intrinsic relationship between people and nature. 
And the way it works, basically, is that because you are linked to your plant, when you take out, um, when you pursue healthy activities, then your plant will benefit from that and will also be given more food and water. But if you don't look after yourself, then you might well find that your plant will become ill. So it's very important that in order to keep your plant alive, you look after yourself as well. Not built yet, but a clever idea that came out of the Rio de Janeiro Hacker Challenge. Um, and that brings me to my concluding remarks. Can we expect to look forward to a technobiophilic reality in the near future? First, here's a quick reminder of what I mean by technobiophilia. The, and then on to here. No, wait, oh, here we are, yeah. So the digital and analog are very intertwined and likely to become more so. The question is, will we accept that's true and will we work to capitalize on it on the, and the advantages of it? Or will we refuse to accept it and dream of biophilic cities with no technology? The latter seems pretty implausible. So here we are, poised at a moment of crucial tension. Do we embrace cyberspace as part of the natural world with all its opportunities and flaws? Or do we keep it at arm's length as an unnatural guilty pleasure we shouldn't really enjoy? Edward O. Wilson believes that this dilemma has been embedded in the human mind since the earliest days. He wrote this um, long before the internet came about, but he described a perpetual suspension, quote, between the two antipodal ideals of nature and machine, forest and city, the natural and the artifactual, unquote. This dilemma is also a challenge. Can we meet it? When we design our new cities or redesign existing ones, we can, if we wish, choose to integrate not two sets of ideals, but three the creativity and innovation of the urban, the restorative stability of the natural world, and the global connectedness of the digital. You can see the potential in this work by artist Dan Rosgaard. Inspired by Van Gogh's painting Starry Night, he created a one kilometer long cycle path in Eindhoven, Holland. It's illuminated by thousands of twinkling stones that feature glow-in-the-dark technology and LED light solar powered. This is a beautiful example of what can be achieved when nature, technology, and the city are brought together in harmony. So I'd like to end with a quote from author Barry Lopez. In the last pages of Arctic Dreams, his epic account of the Canadian far north, Lopez stood at the tip of St. Lawrence Island and reflected on his expedition. He wrote, to bring, to, to bring what is actual together with what is dreamed is an expression of human evolution. I think we have an opportunity with biophilic cities to bring together the actuality of nature with the dream of the digital. I hope we embrace it. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, just a few questions. Uh, so Tim was wondering, in the spirit of your location in Weymouth, how much of the digital world um, can help to better connect us to oceans and the marine world? Ah, right. My, my location is actually Bournemouth rather than Weymouth, but I am very close to Weymouth. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, particularly since the um, book The Blue Mind, um, which I'm, I know you've had, um, I've forgotten his name, but Nichols, um, the author of Blue Mind, um, speaking here as well. Um, and that's a very interesting question because of course, there is at the moment um, a bit of a difficulty with taking the digital into water because of the problem of electricity, if you see what I mean. But there is obviously a really close link between the way that we think about um, the internet and cyberspace as a kind of watery oceanic space and our experience in, in real watery spaces. Um, in fact, uh, Tim O'Reilly, who's a very well-known um, tech guru, told me when I interviewed him about this that when I ask people, if you think of the internet as a real space, what kind of space would it be, a real landscape? Tim O'Reilly said to me it would be like the ocean because like the ocean, you can only ever see a small amount of it at any one time wherever you're in it. 
Um, and a lot of people do think like that. I haven't yet seen much evidence of the two things coming together, but I'm looking for it and I'm keen to hear about it. How can cyber parks help government officials to think of ways to make better public spaces? And then also, um, do you have a favorite cyber park? Or could you talk a little bit more about what cyber parks entail? Right. Well, the way that we are working at the moment is that um, two or three times a year, we're meeting up in a different city in Europe. So, so far we've met in Brussels, um, Lisbon, Barcelona, and I believe that coming up in 2015, well, we've already met in Bristol, but I wasn't able to go to that. Um, also, I think we're going to be meeting in Poland and Malta this year. So, every city that we go to involves a trip to selected areas of the city which the local teams Thing could be um, couldn't possibly become a cyber park, and the local councils are often very closely involved in that. They will often come along and talk to us about the particular park issues they have in their city and how they think we might be able to help them solve the problem. Um, and quite often, there are places that um, the the local team or local university is already working on developing cyber solutions. Um, so at the moment it's very early days. Um, but one thing that people have agreed on is that we are talking about physical parks where you physically go and connect with nature. The idea is that the digital side of it facilitates and enables that, but what is key is that you are physically in nature. Now, we might not need to have made that decision because we could have talked about um, some of the things that I've mentioned, the, the digital um, parks as well, the idea of people being in Grand Theft Auto games or being in a park in Second Life. But the feeling of the group was very much, no, that's not what we're doing. We're talking absolutely about a physical place and a, a physical sensory experience. But I can't point to anything that would be my favorite because at the moment my favorites are all still digital. We haven't made anything yet. Can you talk more about the um, Technobiophilic Design Challenge? Uh, it sounds like a really great way to engage communities but also universities and young people. Yes. Um, well, I have got quite a lot of notes on that and then I um, cut them back because there was too much information. Um, but for example, I'll just look at my notes here. So these are some of the things that I asked them to think about. Um, I said, for example, we already have lots of apps which measure, measure heart rate, blood pressure and other bodily functions. But is there a way to collect and cross-reference this data? about the user's physical well-being with information about the environment that they're in. For example, um, if you leave your office at lunchtime and go and have a sandwich in the park, um, would your app know that? Would your app know where you are in relation to the changes perhaps in your body? Um, I'm not aware of any app that currently will put those two things together because there kind of isn't really a request for it, but there could be. Um, so, could you measure and analyze your physical parameters to generate a scale of your well-being measured over time uh, against your kind of body readings as well, your physical readings? Um, could you then look at the results of that and realize what kinds of behavior would be better for your health? Perhaps. Obviously, we know that you can say, I'm going to do 10,000 steps a day, but what if it was saying, well, actually, you need to be in close proximity to a tree or grass once a day. Um, we don't have that kind of app. Um, and the other kind of thing that I asked them to think about in terms of hardware and software was that um, biophilic design architects might build houses with turf roofs and uh, water features and that kind of thing. We don't think about that with hardware and software design at all. There's no reason why there should be so much plastic and metal 
in, and glass in digital culture. There's not enough wood. There are already people producing wooden keyboards, wooden mice, even wooden mobile phones. But we're not really seeing them very often, particularly in the West. There are more of them available in the East. Um, why so many straight lines in, in the hardware that we have to use? Again, we don't need that. We could have more curves and circles. So they're the kind of things that I was trying to say to the designers. Look, you know, we don't have these, but we could benefit from them. Does that help? Yeah. Um, and actually sort of touching upon that, um, so society acknowledges that we have this dependence on technology, but we're still very negative, I feel, towards our acknowledged dependence on technology. So do you see the production of apps and um, restorative technologies that are being used in places like hospitals as a sort of gateway which could open people's minds to using technology to emulate or mimic nature and highlight the positive that technology brings to our lives? Yes, I think so. I think that that prejudice against technology and we have to admit it's very widespread in the um, amongst people who are already keen on nature and the environment and so on um, it's something that we really have to get over ourselves about I mean for example I live close to the new forest which is a large ancient forest here and um, the people who run the new forest and that national the I can't remember the name of the organization, but the people who run the forest are always trying new ideas to bring people into the forest. So last year, they had a tech crash, and they said to people, you can take all your phones, when you come with your family, take your phones, and we'll lock them up in this box for you, so you can't go without your phones all day which is not something that would appeal to me. <laughs> um, and there are lots of reasons why it's quite useful to have your phone, not least the fact that they also have an extremely good mobile app to help you find your way around the forest. So they're trying lots of different ways, you know, mobile apps to help you find your way in the forest, but at the same time the offer of actually don't bother with that, leave your phone in the crash. Um, and I think lots of places are doing this, this kind of trying to straddle both sides, really, to make their peace with technology. Um, it uses up a lot of energy, I think. Um, so I think we are at a time when we have to try stop, to stop this kind of knee-jerk reaction. And when I thought about giving this presentation, I thought, this really is an issue for biophilic city people because you're so focused on bringing nature into cities, but what are you going to do, or what are we going to do about technology in cities? I mean, perhaps there are other people working on that, but I couldn't find anybody. How has the techno-biophilic message been received by the traditional um, nature, conservation, and environmental communities? Well, I found it very interesting in that it has been well received. Um, two particular examples is the National Trust here in the UK um, have been very interested in the, the research and they um, commissioned me to write something for them last year and this year they commissioned me to write something for an e-book specifically about helping children um, use technology to explore their natural environment more efficiently and more enjoyably or you know to kind of bridge the gap um, and I was also very pleased to be working with Orion the environmental magazine last year they published a piece of writing by me about the um, similarities between the internet and the sea to go back to an earlier question and they've just commissioned another piece from me um, for the enumeration section of Orion, which will be out in the autumn, which again is looking at the kind of natural history of the internet. So I, I'm very proud that Orion are taking it me seriously and that the National Trust are taking me seriously.
Do you think technobiophilia could be a solution to inequitable access to nature for low income and minority groups who might be unable to access nature in their communities? Well, that, that question goes back to that Spanish research, doesn't it, about how people, um, the, it, it seems pretty true that you can achieve the same restorative benefits from virtual nature. But that seems very worrying, doesn't it? <laughs> that um, if that is the case, then in uh, areas where people can't have access to physical nature, that they could be, if you like, fogged off with a virtual version. And from what I've seen from my research, it looks as if that might get the same benefits um, in terms of you know restorative benefits and so on. But Obviously, in the longer term, that sounds like a very bad idea. But I think it's something that we need to watch for, and it's certainly something that those Spanish researchers um, looking at the, um, the, the TV ad were, were really very conscious of, that they felt it was uh, worrying that you could, if you like, fob people off with real nature and have a, have a positive result. So I think we need to be careful about that. Because at the end of the day, there are other um, benefits from physical nature that are impossible to get from, um, you know, from virtual nature. But that takes us back again to the so much research, which when I first saw it, I thought, oh, this is all about people's encounters with nature. And then gradually it dawned on me that so many of these experiments were not about physical interactions with nature. They were through screens. So there's a, you could say there's a challenge there for the environmental psychology lobby as well. Is you know are they are they really being honest <laughs> about what they're saying? Right. Um, one of the listeners was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more, in your opinion, about why a person would want to go to a natural park and still be interested and being on their mobile phone instead of enjoying the physical nature that they're present in? Well, the kind of thing that I've, I've seen happening and that we talk about a lot at cyber parks, um, there's a range of different things. One is, for example, you simply, you could be using your phone like a map um, to find your way around. Um, you could be using it as an information source for the same kind of reason. Um, apps like Laya, L-A-Y-A-R, um, will show you layers of things in one place depending on the uh, information that's put in it. So for example, you could stand by a lake and your phone might tell you not just that, you know, obviously you're by a lake, but could tell you information about what's inside that lake, how that lake came to be, you know, different species living in it and so on. So all of those things are about information rather than a direct sensory engagement. But I know that there are a lot of artists who are very interested in connecting the sensory engagement with nature with some kind of virtual interaction, um, which may be with other people. You know, you could be in your park, I could be in mine, but we could be connected um, across the digital. So that's a kind of different experience to actually just walking through a park on your own or with other people, um, kicking up the leaves and, and being present in the moment. So it's not the same, but it's a different experience. And one of the things which really pushes the cyber park project is that they, many people in the group feel very strongly that this is how we can bring young people into parks is by offering them that mobile digital experience and that that would get them into parks. Personally, I'm not so sure that that's really what we need to be looking at, but it's a driver for the EU funding, if you like, um, that we should use it that way. I think that makes a good point that a lot of these apps or mobile technology, cyberspace, these technologies are a source of knowledge that helps strengthen our understanding of and connections with nature. Um, 
So maybe it's not always the interactive sort of like fish pond, like the koi pond that you showed earlier, but uh, we recently did some research for the upcoming Biophilic Cities newsletter, and I was looking at different apps that you can put on your phone to try and learn about the night sky, to try and connect people with that outside natural resource that we don't get to see a lot because of light pollution. Yes. Yes, that, that, exactly. And there are, yes, because there are apps that can show you the night sky as it is right now, aren't there? Um, and uh, that reminds me as well that another thing that we can use our phones for and that people absolutely do is taking photographs and sharing photographs. And um, here in Bournemouth, like many other cities, I'm sure, um, lots of people take photographs of sunrises and sunsets. And um, I'm a member of a Facebook group of Bournemouth sun, sunrises and sunsets. And it tickles me because on a day when there's going to be a good sunset, everybody's down on the beach taking photos. And then they post them on Facebook. And that gives a lot of people a lot <laughs> of pleasure. It really does give people a lot of pleasure and for other people to go and look at them. Um, and what's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, social media allows us to do that now, to share that pleasure. In fact, that was the cartoon that didn't work on the first slide. The cartoon was about somebody saying, I've just seen an amazing photo of a sunset um, on Facebook. So we, we share a lot of the pleasures in ways that we couldn't do before. Well, thank you, Sue, for sharing your work and reminding us that nature is all around us, <laughs> even in cyberspace. I think your blog provides some really fascinating examples of how new technology can connect people with the natural world, such as the Symbio app that resulted from the Rio de Janeiro yeah. hackathon you mentioned. And they all seem to show an yeah. evolution of our complex relationship with technology and nature. So it's been great thank hearing you for from you. Me. It's been a pleasure. Um, this is our last webinar for this academic cycle, and everyone on the Biophilic Cities Project is so thankful to the listeners who follow this webinar series. We hope you found the content useful and interesting enough for sharing. So 